Hello, everyone, and welcome to the, the final panel session of the day. Um, we are joined by a very illustrious uh, panel here that I will introduce, and hopefully we have some others joining us online as well. Um, so welcome to the panel discussion entitled Fostering Disability Inclusion Through the UN SDGs. I'm Robert Ludke, and I'll be moderating the session today. I'm wearing a blue suit with a UN SDG lapel pin, um, and I'm sitting in between our two distinguished guests who I'll introduce shortly. Disability cuts across each of the SDGs, and really the vision of the SDGs cannot be achieved without creating a truly inclusive society that in integrates everyone into the long-term value creation of society, and I think that's something that we'll touch on a little bit later. The goal of this panel is to foster a, a better understanding of the intersection between disability and the SDGs while exploring the, the gaps and necessary areas of improvement so that the SDGs can fulfill their mission of creating a truly inclusive society. I'm a senior fellow at the Harkin Institute at Drake University in the United States. Uh, the Har Harkin Institute was founded by Senator Harkin, uh, my former boss. I once had the pleasure of serving as an intern as my very first job uh, on the Subcommittee for Disability Policy, which was chaired by Senator Harkin, shortly after the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law. In my current role, I'm leading a project focused on building the business case for disability inclusion. And my argument is that the companies that truly foster uh, an inclusive and diverse workforce are better able to generate long-term value, not just for the company, but for society as a whole. My belief in particular is that investors, such as pension funds, asset managers, and uh, private equity firms, are uniquely positioned to advance disability inclusion across the private sector through their engagement with companies um, in what's known as environmental, social, and governance frameworks. The reason I bring that up is uh, my next paper on that topic will be released at the Harkin Summit in June. And one of the reasons I'm so excited to attend this conference is I would love to, to talk to any number of you and, and gain your insights on that, on that uh, important topic that I'm researching. And so I'm really looking forward to making uh, connections with all of you. So if I could, let me just give a brief overview of some of the, of this conversation. We have our, uh, some of our panelists joining virtually, as well as a new panelist, uh, Samita, to my left. I'll introduce them in depth in a moment. And I want to give a bit of an overview of this topic, because the hope is that we get through our remarks uh, fairly quickly, and we leave plenty of time for a Q&A, both for those who are here in person, as well as those who are joining us online. So really, um, at its core, um, we're talking about uh, not just achieving the vision of the SDGs because it's a goal that we want to, it's a goal that we've set for ourselves, but rather it's how we achieve them. If we do not achieve them in a way that's truly inclusive and uh, allowing for everyone in society to participate not only in their development, but also in the end result of creating a more sustainable and inclusive society, we really can't claim to have ever achieved the SDGs. As we know, disability inclusion is intersectional to every one of the SDGs. Um, you really cannot say that you've achieved one of the SDGs if you haven't truly made it inclusive. The one that um, I believe that we'll actually touch on later in this conversation is the one that I think is most overlooked, and that's uh, Goal 17. And what Goal 17 is really all about is the collaboration across all sectors of the economy to achieve the other 16 SDGs. And, and again, I think that's one that often gets overlooked in conversations like that, and that's the one that we really need to, to focus on in, with audiences like this, where we have such a wonderful cross-sector uh, of, of people from around the world and in all kinds of industries. And the key question that we really want to focus on today is, from a disability inclusion perspective, what will success look like when the SDGs are achieved? And so, as we are going through our presentations here over the next few minutes, 
I would ask all of you to keep that question in mind and use that to frame how you, how you want to ask us questions and how we can provide more insight and, and, and thoughts to the intersectionality of, of the SDGs. So now each, let me inter briefly introduce uh, each of our panelists. Uh, Daniela Voss, who is unable to join us, uh, has submitted a short video presentation. She's the director of the Division for Social Policy and Development at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. In addition to her work at the UN, she has served as an advisor to the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Council of Ministers on Human Rights and Social Affairs. My hope is Aiko Akeyama can join us. Uh, she is an international expert on disability rights and disability inclusive development. She's been uh, a disability advocate at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific since 2002, in her, and she is based in Bangkok, Thailand. Carolyn Casey, to my right, uh, all of you know so well, um, but I, I do want to briefly touch upon her work with the Valuable 500 because I think it does set the stage for uh, a lot of the conversation today. What I think is so impressive uh, about Caroline and the Valuable 500 is she launched it at arguably one of the world's most powerful forums at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland, which is really built around the, the cross-sector collaboration to achieve big objectives in society such as the SDGs. Uh, through her work um, at the Valuable 500, she signed up 500 multinational organizations with a combined revenue of over $8 trillion, employing 20 million people worldwide who are committed to radically transforming the system. And to my left is our, our newest panelist, uh, Sumita Kineshakaran, Kina um, has joined us. Um, she is... Um, she worked for over five years in Singapore and the Asian region, uh, helping build a more inclusive society there. And she's now working on innovation, partner ecosystems, and fostering cross-sector collaboration um, here at the Project Zero. So with that, if we could cue up Daniela's video, we'll turn it over to her. <laughs> Later in the presentation, great. Okay. So, Carolyn. Oh, okay. We are now we, we are now Caroline accelerating now your remarks. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, firstly, I want to probably just do a bit of audio description, and I think it's probably will bring a smile to those of you at the end of the evening. So, um, apparently, I've been told I look like <clears throat> the green giant. Or Hector, did you give me some other green magnificent goddess? British reference, sorry, let me just be British on that one. But the Green Giant is also quite, um, is that American as well as British? Anyway, I'm wearing a 1980s uh, quite uh, luminous green boiler suit uh, for the Zero Conference. I'm a white woman with very white blonde hair. I have a condition called ocular albinism, which means my skin is incredibly white, very blue eyes, and I have a pair of very dark black glasses. And for the first time in two years, I'm not sitting beside my washing machine. I am sitting in the main plenary room of the Zero Conference with, I think, a video of myself behind. So I was not expecting to speak first. I was always a good person to respond to things. But let me just to respond exceptionally to what you're saying, Robert. I've been in this space of disability inclusion coming up to 22 years. Um, and it was extraordinary to me when I first came into this sector that disability wasn't named within the Millennium Development Goals. It was the absence of disability in life, in mainstream life, that contributed to the fact that I did not own my disability and was in the disability closet in business, which I tumbled out of about 20 years ago. When we talk about leaving no one behind. I used to be so frustrated when I used to sit at leadership events and hear things like education for all, inclusive travel, inclusive health, leave no one behind. And yet there was nobody there 
that was speaking about disability. And if disability existed, it was on a disability panel. It wasn't the voice of a leader with a lived experience of disability on panels speaking about education, policy, development, health, transport. And yes, there was a few extraordinary leaders who we all have known and stand on the shoulders of them, but often it was in a special session. Leave no one behind on disability being imperative in achieving the sustainable development goals. Absolutely. It's not even for discussion. We cannot eradicate poverty if we do not look to disability and how that is formed. We cannot eradicate disease if we're not willing to get the solutions to everyone. But it is extraordinary that in 2021 at COP, and I said this in our opening, that a Minister for Energy could not get in to join in the discussions about the safety and the well-being of our planet and environment because she was using a wheelchair. How is that still possible? So for me and the work that we do and the part that Robert and I became incredibly excited about and actually our first conversation I think was, went on for hours nearly is in the same way that we cannot achieve the goals and the aims of the sustainable development goals without disability inclusion. Well, we cannot achieve them without business. And there is no way that we can, in any hope, create an inclusive society without an inclusive business system. And if we look at the UN Global Compact, which touches 14,000 companies across the globe with the attention of the CEOs. Where has disability really been to date? Where has the disability metrics been within big business performance tools? How do we report on disability? Is it even reported on? When we don't speak about disability, it's the same as things that we don't measure, they do not get done. For me, and this is only from where we stand, and what the Valuable 500, I hope, brings to bear, because business is looking at the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. As we enter this era of collaboration and interconnectedness, what we do in the Valuable 500 is ensure we have broken the CEO silence on disability business inclusion, radically transforming that business system to integrate and to normalize disability across our value and supply chains. No more excuses business, no more excuses. What we saw in the pandemic in 17 days, 17 days, we were able to see a business system radically transform the way they operated in ways that they could not before because it was too complicated or too expensive for them to do before. But we realized in the pandemic that the most of the businesses that were able to adapt quicker had been inclusive disability from the outset. So my challenge in this conversation is for disability to be part of the and achieve the sustainable development goals, it needs to be core and strategic in our business systems, accountable by our CEOs and our leadership, but it must lead to supporting systemic action and change within the business. Well said, amen to all of that. And I would say my challenge in this conversation is to, is to uh, au contraire, is to, is to urge the audience to uh, engage in a nice dialogue with us because I think the softball questions may be there. I'm armed with the, uh, the gotcha questions. Uh, so, uh, so Hello, I... Lof, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, oh. we can. Oh, okay, no, 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 I, I'm sorry. No, 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 I just, didn't do... I just wanted to draw your attention that I'm actually here. Aiko, we're so glad you could join us. Um, so. <laughs> Samita will make a few remarks, uh, and then we'll, we would love to hear from you as well. Okay, thank you very so, much. Samita, you've, you've traveled the world, you've worked around the world, cross sectors, and we would love to hear your perspectives on this. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, so hi everybody, my name is Samita, and I'm with The Zero Project, fairly new, uh, joined about a year ago, and before that I was working uh, for a few years in, dis in the disability sector in Singapore and in the wider Asian region. And um, I'm so happy that Robert brought up the point about partnerships because I feel 
this is such a critical role when you talk about the SDGs and what partnerships looks like in different areas of the world is vastly different. I mean, what works in, in Asia might not work in, in Europe, for example. And I think that's what we're all here to, to learn and understand and see how we can bring these, these um, connections, these networks and these ecosystems together. Um, and both my, my panelists, uh, Bob and, and Caroline, have really touched on a lot of key topics about how the pandemic has actually shown us how easily things can be changed if we wanted them to change. So I'm excited to hear from the, the attendees. Um, please throw your questions our way, and we'll be doing our best to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Samita. Aiko, we would, we would now love to hear from you and your perspectives um, in Bangkok. I go, I think you're on mute. Good, sorry. There Hello, you go. can you hear me? Welcome, okay. thank you. Good evening from Bangkok. And then I'm very excited while it's almost uh, sort of midnight here, but I watched the opening ceremony and then, then, then positive vibe is certainly emanating from there to Bangkok. Um, I, I think in terms of SDGs, Yes, actually the beauty of SDGs is to get counted, to be counted, meaning that persons with disabilities are now in the position to get counted. Through SDGs, we, United Nations, request governments to provide data, be poverty rate or enrollment rate, in schools or uh, 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 website accessibility, all this data should be reported back to border. Are you able to hear me? I'm just kind of hearing myself and then, is it clear? Hello. Can you guys yes. hear me? Yes. Okay, good. all right. Um, I'm from Asia and Pacific, which covers 58 governments. I checked the voluntary national review paper submitted by 44 governments in Asia and Pacific. Actually, all of them talk about disability in their report, which I think is amazing. It's a good start. But at the same time, it poses challenge of disability inclusive SDGs in implementation. It's another side of coin. Again, how data of persons with disabilities are collected, because not too many governments have a systematic ways of measuring the extent of disability inclusive development in, in, a, in a way so that the focal point of SDGs can submit the data to the headquarter. The perfect example of data, which is kind of, a, which is very important, but which is kind of lagging behind is the data on employment. But I'm, I'm so sure that, that there are IRO colleagues there who can talk about it more, but I'm just outlining this challenge. But as Caroline said, I think this SDG is a very, a very good because it brings in people in different sectors. Now, traditionally, and then also in Asian Pacific, there's, there still is an idea that issues of disability fall in social development and social welfare, simply because persons with disabilities are regarded as service beneficiaries. But some persons with disabilities are business owners, workers, professionals, most important of all, their rights holders. So these ideas actually it is reflected, these, these ideas are reflected in the SDGs, but it has to be implemented. So this brings in not only governments, civil society organizations, academics, private sector, you name it. Um, so 
I just like to say that our organization, SCAP, has been really trying to promote the paradigm shift, of course, from charity-based approach to rights-based approach on disability issues, but going beyond ableism and going beyond only social welfare approach and really promote get counted to be counted approach. So we are building capacity of governments to do more disability statistics. In addition, this is my last point and then I will you know, uh, enjoy questions and answers. Now we have within the UN system, UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, acronym of which is called UNVIS. That requires to mainstream disability, whatever you do. It doesn't matter UN, uh, a certain UN entity or section doesn't work on disability per se, but they are required to mainstream disability into their own work. So not only we are promoting disability inclusive development and disability rights to governments and private sectors and CSOs, we walk the talk. We also are requested to do that by the Secretary General. So there is a good synergy between SDGs and then UNDIS, UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, so to speak, there has been increasing, dramatically increasing number of UN entities doing more on disability work or working on accessibility. Although I noticed what Caroline said about the minister and was unable to even go into a international meeting, but I just like to know that there has been there have been very positive movements within the UN, and there have been a development of disability inclusion culture. So on that positive note, I'd like to finish my initial uh, statement and then and over back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Aiko. So let me ask uh, the first question, and I would like um, each of the panelists to, to answer this, and maybe we'll start with Samita and go to Caroline and then Aiko. And that is, um, you know, there's a lot of worry right now that we won't achieve and we're not on track to achieving the SDGs as a whole, uh, let alone, you know, regarding disability inclusion. I mean, we're talking, you know, resource consumption, pollution, um, you know, poverty and inequality. So where would each of you say, you know, almost as a report card, you know, wh where do we stand in terms of the disability inclusion aspects of the SDGs? Are we on track? Are we behind schedule? Are there some, you know, best practices we can, we can take from and be excited about? So, Samita? Thanks, Robert. Um, personally, I feel this is a rather loaded question because um, when you talk about report card, it's easier to think of ourselves as individuals. You know, how does a country do? How does a region do? But I would caution and say that um, we are in this all, we are all in this together. Um, and we are only as strong as our weakest link. So if you have a country, I don't know, like the ADA, that has a brilliant example of what disability rights and disability advocacy can do, at the same time, you have a country um, in, in Asia, for example, that doesn't even recognize discrimination or legislation, for that matter. How well are we really doing? Um, you know, is that an A? Is that an F? How are we? It, it's hard to say. And so I think we need to, to take ourselves out of this um, this viewpoint of okay, you know, um, for example, in Austria, sure we're doing pretty well, but does that really mean we're doing well when it comes to disability? And when it comes to disability, it's so interconnected. We're going back to this whole partnerships number seventeen again, that. It, I feel like we need, to, we need to think of it as a whole. We're only as strong as our weakest link. And so on that note, hopefully not too pessimistic note, I think we are in the right direction, but I think we can do a lot, lot better. And that's how we can all work together to, to kind of achieve that. Over to you, Caroline, or Robert. Thank you. Aiko, if you're still with us, we would love to hear your thoughts on where, where you think we stand on, on achieving the SDGs um, in terms of disability inclusion today? Um, I think we are at the beginning. I don't think we are, 
as uh, Samira says, either off the track on track. And then I think I already mentioned about the data issue. Um, so, but I, I, I think that the start, as a start line, we, are, we have a good start. As I said, voluntary national review from many countries now mention about disability. But you need to really look into how they defer to disability. Are they just referring to persons with disabilities as beneficiary of social protection services, which is which is important. But as Mira says, like whether they are recognized as a human rights holder, whether uh, they talk about ensuring uh, anti-discrimination measures in place, uh, whether they talk about persons with disabilities as decision makers. Uh, we did a brief uh, analysis of BNR available uh, from 44 countries in Asia and Pacific, and it doesn't seem like that, that, that a lot of uh, papers talk about uh, persons with disabilities as decision makers, be it politicians or uh, like, you know, head of some um, a decision making mechanism such as some consultative mechanism on gender or climate change or whatever. So I think we are still looking in, I, I think that the country's uh, or government's approach towards disability inclusion in, in the SDGs should be as comprehensive as possible. Not, I mean, of course, people like to have a, you know, low hanging fruits approach to, to look at uh, how services are available for them, but I think we, they need to expand their uh, horizons. That's my second input. Over back to you. Thank you, Caroline. Any final words? <clears throat> um, this is so hard because I'm often accused of being too optimistic sometimes or too positive. Maybe people don't see me behind closed doors when I'm like gritting my teeth saying not enough, not fast enough. But I do agree with um, Ikeo. I think we're at the beginning, but I think we're at a different beginning. It feels like a different beginning from all the other beginnings before. I feel the environment is different, and I think what I am hopeful for is that we are seeing, to Sumita's point, this radical collaboration, even where we're seeing business brands, like you saw Hector Minto and Christopher Patno from Google and Microsoft sitting on the same panel, so when we're starting to see collaborative competition, I think that's where hopefully disability is being integrated now through collaboration, not left on the side like some special piece, but being integrated and woven in. And the key to this is we have to invest in our data. Our last big report on disability inclusion was what, 2011? Um, so we have to see that move forward, but we need to see disability metrics infused into it. And I could not agree more. We have fabulous talent with disability but sitting in positions of power. Um, is there enough being done yet, Robert? No, because we wouldn't be here. But if we keep having to look on what we can build on, and I think what we're building on here is a unique collective around the world that can ensure that will change and this new beginning can be built on. That's what I choose to believe. Sorry, Robert, uh, from Asia and Pacific, uh, for example, in Thailand, uh, can you hear me? Oh. Yes, we can. Hello? Oh, sorry, sorry, because it just disappeared, because I think you're asking some examples. Uh, we, we're going to talk about it tomorrow, but in Thailand, they're now trying to uh, integrate a public procurement process where a, 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 a private sector uh, complying with uh, uh, accessibility standards or public sector being able to demonstrate the fact that they can produce accessible goods and services that these become conditions of uh, joining in the bidding. So you might think Thailand as a developing country or mid, mid uh, development country, but uh, here in Asia, the people started to, 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 to develop such uh, mechanisms, which is going beyond the social development and social welfare uh, uh, arena, so to speak. Or even in my country, in Japan, people are more open and interested in um, 
a, a mainstreaming disability perspectives into entertainment industry, uh, like be it uh, film or hospitality industry or TV. So there are more like dramas on TV, which which talks about persons with disability, disabilities, uh, not in a non-serious way. So uh, yes, uh, as Caroline said, there have been pockets of success coming out um, as we are surrounded by uh, enabling uh, uh, instruments such as SDGs and of course, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And also, don't forget Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction. Thank you and over back to you. Caroline, please. I have to I have to say that issue of procurement is a is something we're starting to see within the valuable 500 companies and I do that think that's where you see you know cross sectoral change or the systemic change when a company like Vodafone for example had put a policy in place to ensure that anybody that it had on its supply chain had similar practices policies and procedures and if I think about the conversation you and I have been speaking about investment that is where we can trigger a more systemic move and a more integrated approach. So yeah, I totally agree with IKO. Well, and to, to build on that point, I do a lot of work uh, looking at global supply chains. And there are a lot of tells in how a company is either responsibly or not responsibly managing its supply chain. If in its procurement, it is specifying things like inclusion, in you know, certain environmental standards, compliance with some of the standards we've talked about today. That is a tell of a responsibly managed supply chain. That is a tell of a company trying to affect systems change. And so I would just, you know, we all have our favorite companies that we like to follow. We have companies we get excited about when they introduce a new product. I would urge all of us to, you know, as we say in the United States, look under the hood. Look at their sustainability reports, look at their procurement guidelines, and actually see if they are in fact holding their suppliers accountable, using their purchasing power to drive these kinds of considerations into how they source and manufacture products. Because if they are, that is, that is actually change that's coming up from the top. If they're not, they're letting their suppliers off the hook, and change it really isn't going to occur. This is, these are all empty words. So let me, yes, we have a, a question from the audience. Thank you. Um, um, my name's Amanda Gibbard. I'm from the Department of Transport in South Africa. And um, what you're talking about really interests me. I think it's an incredibly important area of how the world is, is or is not going to change. And one of the things that I was um, thinking about was, was the COVID-19 pandemic and how it shows us how we can change. Um, unfortunately, when you look at some of the sort of social indicators, um, the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and people with disabilities got discriminated against more. And, and I think, you know, one of the questions in my mind is how do we make sure that change happens that is more inclusive? Um, what is it that we need to do to make sure that is the change that now becomes generated? Because while the panelists drew that comparison, and I think it's a good one, um, I also think it's got its problems. And, you know, it highlights the need to be clear about what we're going to do to make sure we do implement the Sustainable Development Goals. And, I mean, one of the things that I have found in research that I've done over the past two or three years is that the indicators we use to measure this are wrong. They do not support it. If I look at um, the way disability is portrayed, um, there's a very strong link between race and disability discrimination. Um, they come from the same rights-based stable, and yet the indicators and the work on indicators that show quality of life don't make that. In fact, they actually sh show the opposite, and, and it's wrong. It's as if people don't understand the social model of disability and that people with disabilities have a right to equal participation. Um, and I think that's one of the strengths of this conference. Um, I also think that we have need to deal with it because we are all disabled when we're old. We all have disabilities if we don't have them now when we're old. And other people will be in the positions that we are in now 
And if we don't do something about it, they're not going to do anything about it unless they realize it then, and it'll be too late for those of us who are heading towards old age, perhaps more rapidly. So one of the things that I was thinking of is, is it's this issue of, of grants and funding. The UN is responsible for a lot of grants. It sets indicators, and it can do this work. It can produce the kind of indicators that will demonstrate disability inclusion and show it. Um, and I know, for example, we need it. We're doing, busy doing accessible transport systems, but we don't have accessible cities. We've got funding from the World Bank and from whoever else, and we don't measure this properly. So we have a constitution that says everyone's equal, and yet things don't happen that way. So what I'd like to do is ask the panel what they think can happen um, so that we get those indicators and we're clear about what we're measuring not just for global supply chain in the private sector, but for governments to use as tools to measure so that they can see whether the money that they're getting from these private companies or from international funders is spent in the right way and really, really benefiting those people who need this accessible society that we need to create through the SDGs. Thank you. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but thank you for letting me say it. It's been on my mind. Um, thank you so much for your comments. Um, there was one point that I, I really, really wanted to, to, to respond on, and um, that was on, you know, where do we start and the social models of disability and understanding this. And I think, in, in as unfortunate as it sounds, I feel, personally, I feel that disability has become such a political issue. Um, that it's it's only talked about within disability fields. It's it, and I think it's about time that we brought it out of that sphere. And I think a brilliant way of of, of this that's being done right now is um, the We the Fifteen campaign, for example. I think it's an absolutely brilliant initiative that talks about assistive technology and talks about taxation on assistive technology and the affordability of assistive tech and the supply chain, the global supply chain of these technologies through sports. Um, and I think this is where these conversations need to happen. We can talk about sports and disability with governments and not necessarily hit any sensitive spots that immediately shut the, shut the conversation down. So thank you so much for your comments. And um, I would love to hear a lot more about how we can have these conversations going. What are some other um, topics that we might not necessarily think about when we think about disability? Um, and what other intersectionalities that we might be having a bit of a blind spot on. Um, I see Hector had a, had a comment, I think. Um, so handing it over to you. Thanks. Um, I'm super interested in this ESG comment you made at the start, Robert. Uh, I think actually one of the biggest failings we've had, actually not a failing, but I think we're living in a world where companies are talking about sustainability, but disability is just not in ESG. Like even the companies who are doing ESG audits, the companies that are doing guidance, they're not talking about disability inclusion or the structural inaccessibility that's built into businesses and employment and education around the world. So what do we need to do as a community to, to, to find our way into ESG? Um, can I pick up on that one? Um, Hi. This, oh, oh, this okay. issue of the ESG um, has come up quite a lot regarding within the World Economic Forum, Hector, and one of the barriers that they speak to that comes up again and again from the corporate world is the issue of self-ID. And when we speak to that, it's about that, well, I can just give you a piece of research from our valuable 500 companies. 63% of our companies do not know the makeup of their employee base. And when we speak to actually really revolutionizing the way disability is within business or within the ESG model, they say, how can, it, how can we do that if the legislation in our countries does not allow us to um, ask about the true nature of our employee base. Now, our challenge and pushback is, well, why are we not creating cultures of trust to where it's not based on your legislation? But just to say that is a really significant barrier the business world are seeing or are speaking to around the barrier for the ESG model and disability being there is the issue of self-ID. That's a very important point, and Hector, um, last year the Harkin Institute convened a series of panel discussions between the disability community and investors and, and those in the private sector. And 
And the most consistent piece of feedback we received from the investors was they don't understand disability inclusion. So they, they can't create the indicators. They don't know how to then go into the boardroom of these big companies, or any company for that matter, and say, these are the things you need to look at when you are integrating disability inclusion into your ESG frameworks. And so, and it even goes into the venture capital world. They are, they are an open book. The venture capital community is an open book for the disability community to engage with. So that from day one, even before day one, when a company is, a, is in the conceptual stage, that's when you want to integrate disability inclusion into the company. Because after they've received their funding, as one of the venture capitalists told me, it's too late. Yeah. They're just trying to survive, right? They're trying to meet all the pressures that are on them when you, when you launch a new venture. And, and so I do think it is incumbent upon the disability community to do more to build bridges with investors of all kinds, be they venture capitalists, be they asset managers, be they, you know, state uh, government run pension funds and things like that and educate them you know educate them between the the link between a truly inclusive innovative workforce and long-term value creation i mean because that's what they're there for i mean that's that's what investors want they want to invest in the microsoft's the vodafones of the world who are innovating 15 20 30 years down the line so help help the investors get there and i think we 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 all can do a better job on that May I come back to the person who made questions uh, before Hector? Please, yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, hearing what she has been saying, two, two words popped up in my mind. One is government's investment into people. Number two is looking at persons with disabilities, not as a risk factor, but opportunity factor. So with regard to the number one thing of investment part, I'm not talking about private companies investment because this, he, she was talking about widening inequality and then obviously a lot of governments do not prioritize persons with disabilities when it comes to financial planning and all. But if a government looks at this issue as a matter of investment into people, that might there might be a different scenario. I'm talking in the abstract term, but then that also comes to the to the second point about like uh, what to be measured uh, and the indicators that she was talking about. Rather than looking at persons with disabilities as a risk, but for example, what I'm saying is like looking at the universal design principle, if we have ramp, that would be less dangerous for many people, including persons with disabilities, right? So if there is a quantitative scientific and quantitative research to, 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 to prove that safety and, and less risk factor of uh, less uh, risky uh, results of having a universal design in place might be contributing to an idea that uh, doing something for persons with disabilities is an investment and it's actually creating less risk for society as a whole. Am I making sense? So that's my third input. Over back to you. Thank you, Aiko. I know we have two more, at least two more questions. Uh, so the gentleman in the third row will start here. Um, wonderful, thanks so much. Um, perhaps an, a somewhat arcane question um, when we're thinking about investors. Do you think that the lack of understanding um, on the part of investors is one of the reasons why we have not seen any um, lawsuits in the US against company managements for a dereliction of their fiduciary duty 
to try and employ the best people who are out in the market. Because if they don't include persons with disabilities, they're automatically um, excluding a universe, part of the universe of people who should be chosen or even look, just looked at. Um, and um, to me, that's a, a total dereliction of one's fiduciary duty as a manager or a, indeed a director of a company. Should I answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think I would go beyond just the, the lawsuits and the I would look at it as just a lack of overall investor engagement on this topic, not just with the entities in which they invest, but engagement with policymakers, uh, particularly at the, at the federal level in the United States with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, the, this, to its credit, the Securities and Exchange Commission, even in the Trump administration, started taking some tentative steps to um, require, co compel companies to better disclose how they're investing in their people. There is a huge opportunity to use that process that is in its infancy in the Securities and Exchange Commission to educate a lot of people um, on the importance of disability inclusion to those, those very points. The, 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 the innovation which leads to the long-term value creation, not just for the companies, but more importantly for society as a whole. Like the investor community, the SEC doesn't know enough about disability inclusion to fully integrate these considerations into how they're going to formulate these rules. They're very open to learning more. So again, I would just go back to what I said before. Of there, there are ample opportunities for collaboration with a variety of, I think, important entities in society. And I would encourage all of us to, to um, take this opportunity to to forge ahead with that collaboration and, and, and take the game to them. And, you know, and I can only really speak to the United States, but the disability community has done such a wonderful job in engaging policymakers. And I think to take that level of passion, that level of commitment, that level of knowledge, go to the investors, go to the regulators. And there's, there's a whole host of regulatory bodies in the United States that eventually you know, connect to the global system that, again, are ripe for, for opportunity. So, I know we had a question towards the back, so, let, yep. Uh, I want to, I am Antonio Martinez from Spain, and I want to uh, come back a little bit to the beginning of the panel. Uh, we, there were some questions, where are we, are we at the beginning? I uh, agree with Caroline that we are at the beginning, but at the different beginning. And I would like to stress that I think the most important step given in the last decades in the field of disability is the approval of the International Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2006. This is really the shift of paradigm, the change of mentality. It has required governments to do lots of legal changes. So I think uh, it has also uh, had a great influence in the United Nations system itself that now is more, uh, takes more into account the problems and the barriers of persons with disabilities. And, uh, but the question, the problem is that the, the, this convention is a legal document. It's, it um, requires a change of mentality and changes of mentality are not so easy. So my question would be, what else can we do? What else can United Nations, for example, do and the governments do to uh, change the mentality and to, uh, sense, uh, to, to convince, uh, persuade everybody that the problem of persons with disability is not a problem of charity, but the problem of rights. Thank you. Aiko, if you're still with us, I would love to hear okay, your... Yeah, I, uh, I'm here. Um, it's, it takes time to change minds, 
individual minds and collective minds and society's attitudes towards persons with disabilities. But I agree with you, it's very important to really change them. How? For us, being a part of a United Nations, we do it in different ways, uh, but uh, we keep on saying the same message that the persons with disabilities as a uh, uh, rights holders. But you, if you just keep saying the abstract words, it doesn't uh, sink into people's hearts, right? So again, I'm sorry that I, I, I've been passionate about this uh, public procurement uh, methods, but I really think that, that uh, doing for example, uh, promoting preferential contracts to businesses which are disability inclusive. And then if the government is leading that uh, uh, public proc procurement initiatives, and that will change the flow of money and that will also start to affect the mindsets of people that Persons with disabilities are not just a beneficiary of some specialized schemes, because when we talk about preferential contracting to some businesses which are disability inclusive, we are not just talking about persons with disabilities being hired, but they regard persons with disabilities being in management and, and or accessibility through different dimensions are in place. So, I, I, I'm so sure that you don't, you might not be satisfied with my answer, but my uh, immediate response is to demonstrate the rights are being realized uh, by initiative of governments and then their partnership with the private sector. Then at the same time, organizations like us, or well, all of you continue to to, to convey the message of persons with disabilities as same people as uh, just like any one of anyone uh, and holding uh, uh, natural rights. Sorry, I might not be satisfying you, but... Uh, Aiko, that's uh, a really wonderful response and I we're, we're running a bit short on time. Um, so Samita, I know you had a few concluding few additional remarks you wanted to make in addition to ICOs. Um, thank you so much, Robert. So I'll make this quick because I see the, the time is almost up. And I, I, just, just to go back to, to the gentleman's question, what can we do? And I feel like talking about it from a top-down approach is it's, it's dangerous. Um, but I think we need to start looking at what we can do when it comes to the younger, the younger generation. What can we do in schools? What can we do in, in the education sector? Because we can't immediately expect people to start thinking about disability the moment they hit 30 years old, 40 years old when they're in companies. We need to start having these conversations with children, with uh, young adults. We need to mainstream these conversations even in schools. And I feel like that's where the, we can really plant the seed of understanding what disability is, what it means to, to a person with lived experience. And um, yes, that's, that's where I think we need to, we really need to start looking at um, someone who is going to school, learning, growing, and that's where it all begins. Thank you. And Caroline, at the end of the day, I trust you will excite and empower us no, to go I, forth. Well, I, I will excite and empower us all to go and have a beer. <laughs> um, I actually want to agree with Samita. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's our younger generation, and, and just to answer the lady who spoke from South Africa, and the thing about what's happened and emerged since this pandemic, my gosh, the voices, the young, the stories, the real stories that are coming out from every age group in the hands of social media, and that's where I have hope. But who allows these children to go into this school is really important, right? We need to make sure that that happens. But if I was to do a mic drop on one thing, we have to combine the story of humanity and the stats. We have to combine the head of the lack of data and the heart of humanity. 
And this is so important. Without the data and without the research, we are never going to move this forward. Because we were in the pandemic to the lady in South Africa, we did a piece with the FTSE 100 companies in May of last year. Despite the pandemic, one third of those companies' websites were still inaccessible. With the data, we can move it forward. With the stories of the young people and the hearts of us, we can move it forward. But what I do believe with ICAO is it is a new beginning, a proper new beginning that I do think if we come together in all of our different ways, willing to fail because we're innovating, I do believe it's possible. So I just want to say thank you. I'm, I'm empowered. Sumita, as our host, our closing remarks, please. Thank you so much, Robert, and thank you all so much for staying uh, till, till the end of this very, very long day. Um, the Zero Project, this is precisely what we do. We bring people together, we have these conversations, we build these networks, these ecosystems, going back to it. And I would really urge everyone to keep these conversations going. I mean, work with us, uh, get in touch with us. We have an amazing database of thousands of people uh, at your disposal. It's being launched at this conference, so please do check it out. Please reach out to people. Drop them a message that this is where it all begins. Thank you. And I have a new hat on. Hi, how are you? <laughs> and I come back down in as the moderator. Firstly, thank you, Robert, Ikeo, Sumita. Thank you so much, Daniela Bass. We know we have you. We'll post that up online. I mean, to do the last thank session, you. you did brilliantly. Thank you so much. I also want to say to you, those of you who are in the room, we have come to the end of day one. I know, we're at the end of the day one. For all of you out there in the land of listening, yes, please go off. I want to say one thing that's been happening. We're going to end on one video, but just before we do that, we begin tomorrow morning very sharp at 8.50. Now, those of you who need to do redo the PCR tests, Yes, those PCR tests, you need them done. Um, you also probably need to be coming in here around 8.45 to be here on time. Michael is insisting that we start, and rightly so, at 8.55 on the dot. The other thing we're getting feedback from today is we're all really tired. It's taken quite an adjustment to be around each other. Right? It is, okay? Is everybody tired? Yeah, right? And can I also say for everybody who stood on a panel or spoke, you know, in real time, I think it was quite nerve-wracking because we hadn't done it for a while. So thank you for all of our live contributors and all the contributors who came in online. But for those of us, please do not go out tonight and have 20,000 beers because you're tired. Be back in here tomorrow. Be mindful we're tired. Probably listen, some of us are feeling a bit vulnerable. Make sure, if you can't give somebody a hug, just make sure you ask if they're okay, because it's been a full-on day with lots of love, but I think everybody's just a little bit tired and could just do with that, are you okay? So I just want to say thank you to everybody again today for our wonderful Zero Project team. We are not able to host you here, so please go out, as I said, not have lots of beers, go outside and have um, dinner, meet your friends, talk to somebody you didn't know, and to give the final word of the day to, um, I, I guess, he really needs very little introduction. Um, he's a man who has been a mentor and a friend for the disability sector for a very, very long time. And he would have been here, I was only speaking to him on the phone a few days ago, um, but it's Louis Cagayas. And he is just going to speak out his last, kind of finish off our day for us. But his biggest piece is to keep going. We are at an intersection, a moment for real, real change. So to everybody, thank you for being here. Thank you for our panels. Thank you for the team at the back. Thank you for Ava. And we will see you tomorrow at 8.55. You. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a pleasure to participate in the Zero Project Conference, ZeroCom 22, and hear from world leaders, speakers from renowned organizations, and innovators from around the world uh, discussing advances of accessibility for persons with disabilities. As ambassador and permanent representative of Ecuador to the United Nations in New York, I had the privilege of presiding over the elaboration of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities from 2002 to 2005, 
that was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations on December 13, 2006. Let me tell you that December 13 is my birthday, and I think that that was my, the, first, the best uh, gift I have had in all my life. The convention followed decades of work by the United Nations to change attitudes and approaches to persons with disability. It aimed at perceiving persons with disabilities not as merely as objects of charity, medical treatment, or social protection, but to recognize them as subjects from, of human rights needed to be recognized, protected, and promoted, but more relevantly, persons who are capable of claiming those rights and making decisions for their own lives as active members of society, taking ownership of their, of their lives and of their futures. Dear friends, Article 9 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability addresses accessibility with the aim to ensure access with uh, persons with disabilities on an equal basis with other persons. Persons with disabilities have the right to live independently and take part in all aspects of life. To achieve this, countries must may take appropriate steps to give persons with disabilities access to places, transportation, information, and services that are open to the public. As members, as parties, as, as state parties of this convention, they are obligated by an enforceable treaty to do so. The line of the CRPD definition, ZeroCom 22, provides today insight from public transportation systems to financial inclusion, corporate strategies to national action plans, and much more that is surely going to enrich the discussion on the topic of white, with widespread implications. I look forward to learning from good practices from the world of built environment, infrastructure and transportation, information and communication technologies, smart cities, tourism, disaster recovery, workplace adaptation and universal design, all toward an accessible world without barriers that we can all enjoy. I also look forward to congratulating the 2022 awardees for their work toward inclusion, accessibility for all, and commitment to universal design. The awardees come from 35 countries, which encourage us to continue working at an international level for inclusivity and equality that aim to provide persons with disabilities with respect for their inherent dignity and individual autonomy, for, free from discrimination in full and effective participation in society. Dear friends, to conclude, let me state that I am convinced that we still have a long way to go for the full inclusion of persons with disabilities. Accessibility and strengthening inclusion, the sense of belonging, solidarity, and equality must be our priority. The Zero Project Conference can contribute to build societies free of discrimination and without the barriers that limit the enjoyment of human rights, in particular for persons with disabilities. Thank you, and may you have you and your families take care in this important and, and very complex times in our history. Thank you very much. Sehr geehrte Zukunft. Na. Sehr als Zukunft. <lacht> okay. Hey Zukunft. Ich schreib dir eigentlich nicht. Aber versetz dich mal in meine Sicht. Ich sitze jetzt da und tue absolut nichts. Was da draußen ja heißt, nichts ist fix. Und weil das so ist, schreibe ich dir. Weil du bist da irgendwie die einzige Konstante bei mir. Also habe ich eine kleine Frage. Wann gibt es endlich wieder mal lustigere Tage? Wann können wir endlich wieder feiern gehen? Wann können wir endlich wieder im Präsentunterricht nichts verstehen? Wenn wir nichts ändern, werden unsere Kinder dann überhaupt noch mal Schnee sehen? Haben wir für immer diese Zukunftsalbträume? Wann sehen wir wieder mal alle unsere Freunde? Wann wird man sehen, was wir jeden Tag leisten? 
Alter, wenn ich es mir so anschaue, dann ist das wirklich alles echt zum Aufregen. Oder weißt du was, Zukunft? Streich das komplett. Ich merke gerade, ich bin der größte Depp. Ich will ja eigentlich nur mein altes Leben zurück. Ja, auch nicht alles, vielleicht ein kleines Stück. Meine Angst, die kannst du zum Beispiel streichen. Die kann für irgendwas Schöneres weichen. Meine Angst, dass ich ein Nichtsnutz bin. Meine Angst, dass ich nichts nutze und mich das Nichts verschlingt. Für diese Angst habe ich keine Zeit. Ich bin jetzt klüger, endlich gescheit. Ich merke nämlich gerade Zukunft. Du bist zwar groß, aber limitiert. Und wir wollen nicht wegen dir unsere Zeit verlieren. Ohne uns, da bist du nichts. Also solltest du uns so nennen und wir nicht dich. Wir werden tanzen und lachen. Wir werden singen und schreien. Wir werden nie wieder die Schönheit des Präsens verneinen, denn wir sind so viel, laut und bunt. Aber das Wichtigste ist, wir sind die Zukunft. Anfangs, da dachte ich, du bestimmst mich. Ich merke gerade, wer die Macht hat, das bin ich. Wir sind die Zukunft und machen heute unsere Pläne. Nie mehr wieder vergessen wir wegen dir eine Träne. Also, weißt du, was ich wirklich von dir will? Gar nichts. Setz dich hin, schau mir zu. Und sei einfach still.